I fought for God. Who do you fight for, Exile? Hey there, welcome to another Path of Exile guide, this time with the Crackling Lance Inquisitor. While a lot of people have been quite skeptical about this skill's viability, or even preached against it after testing it for 10 minutes, I'm here to tell you it's in fact a pretty awesome spell that can easily clear top tier content. This build has been my league starter for Heist League, and I thoroughly tested starting from literally zero and progressing through all the stages. With a unique playstyle that greatly rewards proper positioning and a player's own skills, Crackling Lance is an amazing spell for anyone who wants a more involved gameplay. As with most caster builds, it's a solid league starter and it doesn't actually rely too much on gear up to mid-tier maps. Most of your damage will come from gem levels and any decent wand or scepter will carry you through the story mode. And speaking of maps, the only mode you cannot run is Elemental Reflect, everything else is fair game. While some, such as No Leech or No Regen might slow you down, they're easily bypassed with an Enduring Mana Flask. The build is also sporting quite a few defensive layers, such as really high chance to block both spells and attacks, Elemental Ailment Immunity, two sources of damage absorption and solid effective HP. Besides that, you're a caster that should operate at safe, long ranges since Crackling Lance is almost a screen-wide spell. Still, I would not recommend the build for hardcore play as physical damage is a big weak spot and without careful maneuvering you'll end up dying because of that every now and then. Before diving into the guide proper, just a reminder if anything is unclear or you have any questions about the build, you can find me streaming on Twitch at twitch.tv slash navandis, links to the schedule in the pinned comment and video description. I'm live 4 or 5 times a week and you'll get to see every upcoming build being put together, leveled up and fine tuned before it becomes a guide such as this one. Finally, the most up-to-date path of building link will always be found in the pinned comment and video description. As usual, the guide is divided into 7 main sections. Build Overview, Passive Tree and Leveling, Ascendancy, Pantheon, Gems and Links, Gear, Flasks and Jewels, and finally Pros and Cons. So with that out of the way, let's start with the Build Overview. The build's main skill, Crackling Lance, has been constantly compared to either Arc or Divine Ire, and while they're all lightning-based spells, the similarities pretty much stop there. Crackling Lance is a standalone spell with its own unique playstyle, and it's neither the better or worse Arc, just an entirely different skill. By default, it casts a single lightning bolt that hits all the targets in a wide cone-shaped area. If anything, it resembles Tectonic Slam more than anything else. Every time you cast a spell, it gains one intensity stack, indicated by this buff icon. Each intensity stack narrows down the area of the lightning bolt and at the same time greatly increases its damage. By default, the max number of intensity stacks is 3, but it goes up to 4 after picking up a significant passive from the tree. Once the spell reaches its max stack, the lightning bolt will transform into a laser beam that deals 3 to 4 times more damage. However, when moving or using a skill such as Flame Dash, you'll start losing intensity stacks. At this point, you've probably already figured out that this dual form of the skill helps the build be equally effective at clearing large packs of mobs on low intensity stacks and fighting bosses when you're at max intensity. Juggling between these modes is the key to success for this build and the more you'll play and practice it, the better results you'll have. It's actually quite rare to have a spell's efficiency scale so directly with a player's own mechanical skills. For example, while mapping, I personally got used to cast the spell once and move at least a bit before casting it again, keeping the number of stacks at 2 or 3. This provides a great balance of damage and area of effect, perfect for killing large packs of mobs. On top of that, once you get an Impulse as Broken Heart, the best in slot body armor for this build, you'll be able to easily clear an entire screen even while shooting the narrow laser beam. This is thanks to this unique item's ability which causes shocked enemies to explode and deal lightning damage in an area around them. So, even when you shoot through the middle of a pack, it should clear it entirely once the first mobs die. Against bosses, knowledge of the arena and different fight phases will help you decide how much you can stand still, spamming your nuke, and when it's time to move, sacrificing a few intensity stacks. 
The build is also investing quite heavily into cast speed, allowing you to more quickly regain intensity stacks after you've lost them when repositioning. Several elements will help you stand your ground and survive through the fights. Frost Shield will soak up incoming damage as well as chill enemies, while half of your ascendancy is dedicated to improving your defenses while standing still. There are a few more utility tools in your arsenal, but I'll talk more about these in the passives, gems and gearing section respectively. And speaking of that, let's actually start with the passive tree and leveling. You start off as a Templar and up to level 28, when Crackling Lands becomes available, you can use Freezing Pulse and Arc. You'll find leveling gem setups in the Path of Building guide. The first 3 acts are packed with amazing passives, as the Templar starting area is one of the busiest on the tree. Retribution, Precision, Light of Divinity and Holy Dominion bring a whole bunch of cast speed, spell and elemental damage, attributes such as Dex or Strength and even some spell crit chance. On the way, pick up Discipline and Training and Sanctity, boosting your HP, Energy Shield and Armor. You then head towards the right part of the tree, getting Arcanist Dominion, Lightning Walker and Nimbleness. Cast speed, spell or lightning damage as well as a bit of crit chance and crit multiplier. These stats will become quite familiar as we'll progress to the passive tree and later on that's mostly what we'll be looking for on gear as well. On the way, grab Quick Recovery Wheel as well as Heart and Soul, increasing both your life and mana pools. Finally, by the end of Act 3 you should be able to start using Crackling Lands, so it's the perfect time to get Intensity Passive, which will bring your max intensity stacks to 4. Don't forget that Act 2 brings with it the Deal with the Bandits quest, and the best option here is to help Alira. Pretty much all her bonuses are useful for this build. Critical Strike Multiplier, Mana Regeneration, as well as a decent amount of Elemental Resistances. This will make both leveling and endgame gearing much easier. In the next 3 acts, you'll keep busy by taking Arcane Expanse, Crackling Speed, Annihilation and Cold Hearted Calculation. It's basically more of the same. Cast Speed, Lightning Damage, Crit Chance and Multiplier, as well as Generic Spell or Area Damage. Fortunately, Crackling Lance has a multitude of ways we can use to scale its damage, so it's really easy to find great passives nearby. On the defense front, Devotion and Written in Blood clusters will greatly boost your HP and Energy Shield, helping you face the more difficult content in the second part of the campaign. While pushing through to Act 9, you'll start building up your Spell Critical Strike Chance and Crit Multiplier. Assassination, Trickery, Doomcast and Throw Seeker will likely double the amount of crit you have up to that point. Coordination is also a great nearby node that provides a good bit of cast speed as well as Dex which is quite useful for leveling up your green gems. And while pathing towards it, you'll boost your HP by a fair amount with Blood Siphon and its adjacent passives. Top everything off with Melding Wheel for even more life and energy shield. As you finish the campaign and up to about level 80, you should start using a shield to benefit from these really strong offensive and defensive passives, Arcane Guarding and Arcane Swiftness. These will increase your chance to block both spells and attacks, as well as your cast speed and spell damage. In addition, Arcane Swiftness will scale its spell damage bonus based on your chance to block attacks. As such, you follow it up with an excellent Sanctuary Wheel, which increases your chance to block both spells and attacks and gives you a total of 24% to all elemental resistances, taking some pressure off your gear. By level 90, your main focus should be on defenses to be able to tackle the tougher content in higher map tiers. Tireless Wheel will add almost 500 HP, helping you push towards that 5-6k life goal. Then there's Mystic Bulwark, further boosting your chance to block as well as increasing your mana pool and mana regen. Top everything off with the Jewel Socket right next to it and then take Mind Over Matter Keystone. With it, 30% of damage will be taken from mana instead of life, a huge bonus to your survivability. Now, normally pretty much all your mana is reserved with auras, but if you're using the best in slot helmet, the Devouring Diadem, this damage will be taken from your energy shield instead. In fact, at this stage in the game, if you haven't already gotten the helmet, you should temporarily take Eldritch Battery Keystone from the passive tree to help you sustain the increasing cost of Crackling Lance. From this point onward, focus on grabbing two additional sockets, Prodigal Perfection and Elemental Focus. Decent jewels can net you 100 plus total life as well as over 300k DPS, so don't ignore or downplay their impact and treat them like any other piece of gear. And that's about it for the passive tree and leveling. In the next section, I'll be covering the Ascendancy class, which improves pretty much every single aspect of this build. The Ascendancy class of choice for this build is the extremely strong yet lesser known Inquisitor. It is a critical strike spellcaster archetype with great defenses and utility, an overall very well balanced ascendancy. Your first points go into Sanctuary. This passive will create patches of consecrated ground while you're stationary, granting you life and mana regen. This synergizes well with Crackling Lance playstyle, which requires you to be stationary quite often. 
on top of that, enemies that stand on consecrated ground created by you will take 10% more damage. Apart from this passive, the build also uses Zelo 3 Aura, which has a chance to create consecrated ground beneath rare or unique enemies you hit, thus ensuring that damage bonus from Sanctuary is constantly active. After completing Cruel Labyrinth, follow up with Pyos Path, a passive which doubles down on the consecrated ground mechanic. With it, while standing on consecrated ground, you'll have increased cast speed, immunity to elemental ailments such as shock or freeze, and you'll regenerate 200 energy shield per second. On top of that, all the effects from consecrated ground, including the bonuses provided by your ascendancy passives, will linger for 4 seconds after you start moving. Otherwise put, you get all these even if you move around but stop at least once every 4 seconds. With Crackling Dance playstyle, this will happen consistently, so you can pretty much consider these as permanent bonuses. Third in line is Righteous Providence, a pure DPS passive. First you gain a huge crit strike chance bonus against targets that have no elemental ailments on them. Then once a target does have an elemental ailment affecting it, you have increased critical strike multiplier against that monster. Critical strikes are guaranteed to apply elemental ailments and with a big boost to your crit chance, your first hit with Crackling Lance will almost guarantee your target will be shocked. And not only do you get the extra damage from shock itself, but also the crit strike multiplier bonus from Righteous Providence. Again, yet another passive that synergizes perfectly with your main skill. Finally, with your last ascendancy points, take Augury of Penitence, a simple 2-in-1 offensive and defensive passive. Nearby targets will take significantly more elemental damage while dealing less of it to yourself. Not spectacular, but a decent addition to the build. With the Ascendancy out of the way, we can take a quick look at the Pantheon choices. Generally speaking, Pantheon choices are situational and there isn't a best pair that will outperform all others in any scenario. However, there are certain options that complement specific builds quite well in a wide range of situations. For this particular case, here are my recommendations. For the Major God, Soul of Lunaris. It provides quite a few bonuses to evasion and chance to dodge, as well as physical damage reduction and movement speed. While none of these are game breaking, nor will they transform your character in a tanking god, it never hurts to add a bit more defense to a build at practically no cost. Another decent option would be Soul of Arakali to help mitigate damage over time and boost your life and energy shield recovery rates. Dots are probably the build's biggest weakness, so getting some defense against them is always welcome. As for the minor god, Soul of Tukohama is likely your best choice. You gain physical damage reduction and life regen every second you're stationary. As you'll stand still a fair amount while casting Crackling Lance, these bonuses will help you stand your ground for longer. Having covered the Pantheon choices, we can now focus on one of the most important aspects of any build, gems and links. Heist League has introduced alternate qualities for both active skills and support gems. These provide different bonuses than the default versions of the gems and in some cases they might add a bit more damage or utility. While none of these are mandatory, nor do they add a lot of DPS, you'll find alternate quality gems in the Path of Building Guide Aid. Some might be dirt cheap, while some might cost over 50 chaos. Up to you if you wish to invest anything into them. With that out of the way, as usual, I'll start off with the main skill, Crackling Lance and its supports. If possible, try to get a level 21 Crackling Lance through Corruption, as this skill gains a large amount of additional damage from extra levels. Support gems are listed in order of their importance, so if you can only get a 5 link, then just drop the last gem I've listed. First one, Intensity Support, should come as no surprise if you've watched the Build Overview section. While this gem doesn't add extra intensity stacks and your maximum will still be 4, it does provide a huge amount of damage for each stack. Then you have Spell Echo, which repeats your Crackling Lance each time you cast it and greatly increases your cast speed as well. However, the extra cast from this support gem will not build up intensity stacks, so you still need to manually cast it 4 times to get to max. Still, the massive cast bonus will definitely help you get there much faster. Third support is Concentrated Effect, a really simple gem. It massively increases your damage while reducing your area of effect. While that might seem like a big downside, in practice you can barely notice any difference. The extra DPS, however, is definitely real. Up next is Lightning Penetration Support, which, as the name implies it, will penetrate enemies' lightning resistance, greatly increasing your damage output. This is especially true against targets that have high resistances, such as bosses. And the last gem in this setup is Energy Leech Support. This will allow Crackling Lands to leech energy shield and boost your damage while doing that. When using the Devouring Diadem Helmet, you obtain the Eldritch Battery Keystone, which causes your abilities to first spend energy shield before mana. As such, each time you cast Crackling Lance, you consume some energy shield and simultaneously start leeching it back, triggering the gem's bonus. 
Next we have a Stormbrand setup whose purpose is to trigger various effects that buff your main skill. This spell creates a brand which attaches to a target and continuously casts lightning bolts in a small area around it. If the target dies while the brand is still active, it will jump to another enemy. You then link it to Power Charge on Critical, Innervate and Onslaught Support Gems. With this, when Stormbrand deals a critical strike, kills a target or simply hits a rare enemy or a boss, you get power charges, additional global lightning damage and the Onslaught buff which boosts your cast speed and movement speed. And while the damage dealt with Stormbrand is irrelevant, it is more than capable of killing white mobs, so make sure you always drop one or two brands on most monster packs to get all the buffs. Then there's another utility setup, this time with a few extra active skills. First we have Frost Shield, a spell that creates a damage absorbing dome while draining around 800 energy shield in about 1 second. Apart from preventing a big chunk of damage dealt by outside enemies, it also chills them and increases your effective spell crit chance by a huge amount. The second gem in this setup is Sigil of Power, a somewhat similar skill. It creates a giant circular rune on the ground, adding some flat lightning damage to your spells. The Sigil's buff would normally become stronger when spending mana while inside the circle. However, you're using energy shield to cast your spells, as such the Sigil will always have just the initial stage. Still, it costs you almost nothing to get a fair amount of extra DPS. Both Frost Shield and Sigil of Power require you to stand in their radius to gain the buffs they provide. While this would be an issue for many builds, with Crackling Lance you're standing still anyway. You then add Flame Dash, your build's mobility skill, and link all three to Second Wind. This support gem lowers the cooldown of all three abilities, while also adding an extra charge to each, allowing you to use them one more time while on cooldown. Next up you have an Aura setup. Wrath, increasing your lightning damage, Zealot Tree, boosting your critical strike chance and creating consecrated ground when you hit a rare or unique enemy, and finally Flesh and Stone. This aura has two stances, Blood and Sand, but you're strictly interested in Sand Stance. You gain absolutely nothing from Blood Stance, so don't ever use it in that mode for this build. In Sand Stance, you'll blind nearby enemies, halving their chance to hit you and you'll also take less damage from distant enemies. The only way you can fit all three auras is if you're using a Devouring Diadem Helmet, so until you get one, temporarily drop Flesh and Stone. Finally, add Steel Skin, a guard skill which creates a damage absorption shield, soaking up about 2200 damage. I use this skill by binding it to my left mouse button, replacing the default move action. As I keep the button pressed, it moves my character as usual, but also casts Steel Skin on cooldown. Lastly, there are two different cast and damage taken setups. These trigger gems will cast any linked active spells after you take a certain amount of damage. A higher cast and damage taken gem will be able to cast a higher linked gem, but it would also require a lot more damage to be triggered. As such, for both these setups, we'll keep the trigger gems at level 1. In the first one, Link Conductivity Curse and Wave of Conviction. Both spells will lower enemies lightning resistance by a large amount, increasing the damage you deal with Crackling Lance against them. In the second cast and damage taken setup, Socket Tempest Shield. This spell will increase your chance to block both spells and attacks and will reset its duration each time you block. Finally, add Blade Blast, which will apply the unnerved debuff on targets, increasing spell damage taken. With the gems out of the way, it's time to take a look at the recommended gear for this build. In this section, for each gear slot I will outline 3 tiers, basic, mid-tier and best in slot. Generally speaking, prices increase significantly with each tier, but so do the benefits that the items bring. The notes tab in the path of building guide contains trade links to help you find and buy the necessary gear. You can tweak the filters according to your budget and character at that time. Your main goal is to cap your elemental resistances, then you should aim to have either flat or increased maximum life on all gear pieces except on your weapon. The rest of the affixes should be a mix of energy shield, chaos resistance and damage ones, mostly in the form of cast speed, critical strike chance and crit multiplier, as well as flat lightning damage to spells. Mana is also pretty useful as it increases the effectiveness of mind over matter keystone, boosting your overall effective HP. Starting from the top, a basic tier helmet needs 70 plus life, 60 plus elemental resistances on an energy shield base item. Ideally squeeze in some chaos resistance or dex to be able to max out your green gems. A good meteor one is the unique crown of the inward eye. Not only can it provide up to 21% increased max life, mana and energy shield, but transfiguration of soul and transfiguration of mind will also boost your DPS proportionally with your total mana and energy shield. As for best in slot, devouring diadem is hands down the optimal choice. First, it reduces the mana reservation cost of any socketed gems by 20%, allowing you to squeeze in an additional aura. 
then it provides the Eldritch Battery Keystone, which causes all your spells to consume Energy Shield first instead of mana. Basically, this item solves a whole bunch of problems for the build. A lot of extra damage through the additional aura, zero issues with mana, and frees up a flask slot which can be used to boost your defenses. Moving on to your weapon, you'll be looking for either a wand, scepter, or dagger. On a basic one, look for 70 plus total lightning spell damage, 40 plus critical strike chance for spells, and some cast speed. For mid tier, add some critical strike multiplier, as well as some flat lightning damage added to spells. These are fairly common mods on wands, so you should be able to find decent ones for 10 to 15 chaos orbs. As for best in slot, you're looking at similar affixes as on a mid tier weapon, but with an additional powerful mod such as plus 1 to level of all spell skill gems or plus 1 to level of all lightning skill gems. Other good options are Wrath has increased aura effect or the similar one for Zealotry. In the offhand, you'll go with a caster shield and this is a slot where you can be somewhat flexible. A basic tier shield needs 50 plus maximum life, increased critical strike chance for spells and some increased lightning spell damage. A bit of cast speed will boost your DPS by a fair amount, but you can also get resistances if needed. For mid tier and best in slot, you'll generally need to decide if you'll focus more on damage or defenses. Combining both would either be insanely expensive for top tier items, or you'll end up with an average salad shield. A bit of everything, but not really doing much. I went with a damage oriented one by getting as much crit strike chance, lightning spell damage, cast speed and maximum life as I could. Ideally, you'd also want plus 1 to level of all lightning skill gems, but that is quite a rare and very expensive affix. You can find a defensive option using the trade links in the path of building guide aid. Up next is the body armor and for basic and mid tier ones, you need 5 or 6 links, 80 plus flat life and 90 plus elemental resistances, ideally on an energy shield base. Percentage increased maximum life, chaos resistance, dex, energy shield or mana would also be great secondary mods to have on this slot. The best in slot option is Impulsa's Broken Heart, with its amazing affix shocked enemies you kill explode, dealing 5% of their max life as lightning damage. While on paper it might not look like it's doing much, in practice it will solve one of the biggest issues this build has. As you keep casting Crackling Lance, you'll gain intensity stacks, increasing your damage but reducing your area of effect from a giant cone to a concentrated beam. While extra damage is nice, most of the time it's overkill versus trash mobs and you'll need to cast it more often to kill an entire pack, simply because you won't hit all of them with a single spell. Impulsas explosions take care of this as they can clear all mobs after you shoot your beam through the middle of a pack. Moving on to gloves, on basic ones look for 60 plus life and elemental resistances and as usual maybe some decks if you still need some to level up your green gems. For mid tier, you're aiming for the same mods as on basic gloves, but add increased critical strike chance against shocked enemies. As you'll shock pretty much all enemies, including bosses, this bonus will be almost permanently active. Finally, for best in slot, go one step further and get a pair of gloves with the same mods and an open prefix where you can craft increased damage while leeching. This is active while leeching energy shield as well, meaning it also has a great uptime. With boots, the choices are quite simple. This is a slot where you need to stack up as much resistance as possible. There are very few damage mods on boots and those are generally really expensive anyway. On basic and mid tier ones, you're looking for at least 60 life, 70 plus elemental resistances, movement speed and some decks. For best in slot, the usual deal. Same mods but higher numeric values and in addition, try to get some chance to dodge spells or attacks. While you're not an avoidance type of character, bits and pieces of dodge and evasion here and there will add up and make you significantly more tanky. Moving on to your belt, quite similar to boots, this is a slot where you should stack up as much life and resistances as possible, including chaos resistance. In addition to that, at mid tier you can look for some increased lightning or elemental damage. This type of mod can be found on crusader influenced items as well as fractured or synthesized ones. The best in slot is, as expected, a Stygian Vice belt with similar affixes but trade the increased lightning damage for an abyssal socket. Even an average jewel will provide much more benefits without breaking the bank. The amulet is a versatile slot in this build and it should be used to squeeze out as much damage as possible while having just enough resistances to be kept. Ideally, look for a jade or citrine base for the extra decks. Regardless of tier, a highly recommended affix on this gear slot is lightning damage leached as life. There are very few sources of life leech with spells left in the game and it's a really strong defensive mechanism. This mod is found on Shaper, Crusader or certain incursion amulets. Apart from that, on basic tier look for 50 plus max life, just enough resistances to be kept and some crit multiplier. 
on a meteor amulet you want the same affixes and in addition some form of increased lightning spell damage. Finally, for best in slot, you can drop a resistance mod and try to squeeze in some cast speed, critical strike chance for spells or the big boy affix plus one to level of all lightning skill gems. Amulets can also be anointed using oils dropped from blight encounters to add a notable passive to them without changing the item in any other way. For this build, my top recommendation is deflection for a balanced mix of offense and defense. A more DPS oriented one, but still offering a bit of defense is Command of Steel, which will increase your spell damage based off your chance to block attacks. Finally, an excellent pure damage anoint is Heart of Thunder, with the added bonus that it will allow your Stormbrand to leech energy shield as well, helping you keep this resource topped off. Rings are quite similar to the amulet in terms of trying to get as much damage as possible while doing your best to get resistances and attributes on slots such as boots and belt. On basic and meter ones, look for 50 plus max life, some increased critical strike chance, percentage increased lightning damage and just enough resistances to be capped. Secondary mods such as mana, energy shield or decks are always welcome. For best in slot, a great setup is Mark of the Shaper plus an Elder Ring. This unique ring will provide a huge spell damage bonus if your other ring is an Elder influenced one. It also comes with a large amount of life and flat lightning damage to spells. Literally nothing is wasted on this amazing and surprisingly cheap unique. As for the Elder Ring, well, it's pretty much similar to a Meteor one, just with the added influence. Up next are Jewels, an excellent source of DPS, life and utility. They really add up, so don't ignore or downplay their importance. The number one priority is to try and get percentage increase maximum life or flat life on every regular jewel you have. The second thing you're looking for on at least one Abyss Jewel is chance to hinder enemies with spells with 30% reduced movement speed. This is an amazing defensive tool for such a tiny investment. It basically translates in extra time you get to kill enemies before they get a chance to reach you. Everything else is dedicated to filling in any resistance holes, getting enough dexterity and pure damage mods. Cast speed, increased critical strike chance and multiplier, flat lightning damage, spell damage are a few examples of excellent DPS affixes you can find on jewels. I can't list them all here, but you can find trade links in the notes tab of the path of building guide. Finally, the best in slow jewel is the usual suspect, a watcher's eye with the mod gain arcane surge for 4 seconds when you create consecrated ground while affected by zealotry. Arcane Surge is a huge spell damage buff which can normally be obtained using the support gem and spending mana with linked spells. However, since you're actually using energy shield to cast spells, this is not an option, so a Watcher's Eye is a great workaround for that. And with Sanctuary passive from the Ascendancy, you'll have this buff permanently. Fortunately, this is a rather cheap mod on a Watcher's Eye, so you might even get away with another Zealot Tree or Wrath mod if you're willing to spend a bit more. Finally, let's talk about Flasks. First, you need a Seeding Divine Life Flask of Staunching. Instant healing is a real lifesaver and bleeding removal is absolutely mandatory while mapping. Second one is an Experimenter Diamond Flask of Warding. Lucky crit chance means the game will roll twice to determine if a hit is a crit and then applies the best result. In practice, this means you get a much higher effective crit chance while the flask is active, so make sure you use it constantly. Warding suffix is also mandatory while mapping for curse removal and immunity. Third is a Chemist Quicksilver Flask of Adrenaline to help you move around faster. This greatly boosts your overall efficiency and makes for a much smoother gameplay. Then you have the really versatile The Wise Oak Flask. Ideally, you should balance all your elemental resistances to have the same value, including the overcap part, so the defensive bonus applies to all three. If that's not possible, then you need to at least ensure that Lightning Resistance has the highest uncapped value of all, so the damage bonus applies to Lightning Damage. When I say uncapped value, I'm referring to the number that's shown in the parentheses for each resistance on your character sheet. And the final flask should be a roomy's concoction for a lot of extra block chance plus armor, a very strong defensive tool in your arsenal. To wrap up the gearing section, here are some excellent leveling uniques which will help you easily progress through the campaign. With the gearing out of the way, it's time to take a final look at the pros and cons of the build so you can better understand if it's what you're looking for. An excellent league starter, it's very cheap to gear up for the first few tiers of mapping and this will help you generate currency real quick and get a head start. Great clearing speed, the build is very efficient at quickly killing large packs of mobs without any downtime. Each gear upgrade will be a significant buff, generally proportional with the investment. As such, it has a very high performance ceiling and the build is great for a long-term project. 
really solid defenses between elemental element immunity, high block chance, damage absorption shield, leeching, you're a pretty tough nut to crack. Efficiency scales with player skill. Careful positioning and manipulating intensity stacks will reward better players with much higher effective damage and better survivability. As for the cons, peculiar playstyle. The way this skill adapts with intensity stacks and capitalizing on that behavior can take some time to get used to. For some people, something might always feel off with the spell. Vulnerable while casting, before getting familiar with the skill, you might be tempted to stand still and cast Crackling Lance more than you should. The fear of losing intensity stacks might translate into dying to something easily avoidable if you've just decided to move instead. Lower damage in dynamic fights. Certain boss fights involve a lot of movement and that can decrease your overall DPS as you can't always reach max intensity stacks. Still, even at 2 or 3 stacks you should have more than enough to tackle any boss in the game. Learn anything new, Exile? If you did, then you'll probably be happy to hear there are more videos coming up in the near future with more exciting builds to try. Make sure not to miss them by subscribing to the channel so you get notified when that happens. And while you're at it, why not like this video as well or drop a comment down below to let me know your thoughts. Thank you all for watching and see you next time.